or, or changed it and forgot to make a note of the new one, so you are putting in the wrong one or maybe a combination of two. And then you get that message that says access denied. Or the one that I find even more annoying, sorry, you're locked out. About six weeks ago, my laptop was hacked. And as soon as I realized what was happening, I shut my computer off and I called my banks and the credit cards and, and all the people and asked them to freeze all of my accounts, which they did, and that gave me some peace while I took my laptop to the Geek Squad, who said that they would scrub it. And I thought, well, that's a strange thing to do with a computer, but not speaking technical language. I trusted them, and they kept it for two days, and indeed they did scrub it, got rid of all the bad, and added some new and stronger um, security. But it did take a couple of days, and now if any of you are like me and do all of your business online, all of your banking and pay all of your bills, and you only carry a debit card instead of cash, my peace turned to some frustration. My whole world was frozen. And I had to go to the bank to even get cash to put gas in my car. But after the computer was fixed and I had gas in my car, I had to get new user IDs and passwords and PIN numbers for all of the things. And not being smart enough to write them all down in a notebook, some of them I had to... Some of them I had to change a couple of times. Have you ever had to do that? I know I have a new password, but I can't tell you for the life of me what it is. And that's the world we live in, isn't it? Needing access and needing passwords and usernames and PIN numbers. In our text today, Paul wrote to a world in which people were desperately f trying to find the right password that would give them access to God. Some thought that careful obedience to Moses' law was the key, and others thought that civic virtue was surely the key, the password that would get them access to God. And yet, just as us forgetting our password or inputting the wrong password, Paul's readers were trying all the wrong passwords. They were missing the heart of Paul's message. His message that it is faith, it is faith through Jesus Christ that gives us the right access. It's not about the good we do or how obedient we are or the people we know. It's not about any of those things. And Paul doesn't begin our text for today with the hope that Christians, that we will one day be justified. Rather, he begins at the truth that we already have been justified centuries ago when Jesus died on the cross. Justified, I find, is a really interesting word. Is that curious for any of the rest of you? Justified. In the world we live in, justified is, with, is if we have good, if we have good reasoning for a decision, then we are justified in making that decision. It's like common sense or well thought out or logical. And in printing, in the printing world, it's, your page is justified if all of the margins are straight. Neither to be, be, be confused with justified through faith that is in our scripture. We are justified through faith in the life and teachings and death and resurrection of Jesus faith that has already been made all of us right with God, standing in God's forgiving grace through Jesus Christ. Paul points out that Christ died for the ungodly, for us, while we were weak and sinners, indicating Christ died for all people. And this is the part that seems to trip people up even for the righteous. And he says, I suppose, 
someone would die even for the righteous. I imagine Paul contemplating this as, as he is maybe thinking out loud and adds parenthetically, isn't it rare that one would die for a righteous person? And it's like, okay, well, that's the way it is. Emphasizing how truly amazing God's love is for all God's people. And now it's clearer. What counts is not so much our access to God as God's access to all of us. It is not that we reach longingly towards heaven, but that heaven reaches out longingly to us. It's not that we are good enough or wise enough or obedient enough to gain God. It is that God has gained us for God's self. There is no access denied. There is no, sorry, you're locked out. There is only God's grace, God's free grace, because God first loved us unconditionally through Jesus Christ. No password required, no special prayer, Remember a few weeks ago when Andrew was preaching about prayer and he said there is no right way to pray? God accepts all of our prayers, whatever shape or form they come in. The same is true here. There is not a right password, just faith in our heart and our soul and our mind, faith through Jesus Christ in a God that is present with us always when we are at our worst, and when we are at our best. In my work as a hospice chaplain, I sometimes get to be part of an amazing and deeply spiritual experience. It happens always. But sometimes the person who is transitioning allows me into those intimate moments when someone they love, someone who has gone on before them and speaks who appears to them and speaks to them. I can't see them or hear them, but the person I'm with can. And when I see hints like staring up towards the corner of the room intently, sometimes reaching out, it's because someone is there. And I have learned to ask gently, Who's here with us? And then they will tell me, it's my brother, it's my mom, it's my grandfather, it's my son, it's my best friend from the military. And when I ask, what are they saying? They say they are telling me that it's okay to come, that it's all good that they're there waiting for me. And I say, it is okay. You're surrounded by love in this world, and you will be surrounded by love when you make that last step into the new life God promises. A colleague in ministry who is an Episcopalian priest and served as a chaplain in a children's hospital for a number of years shared a story with me about sitting in a room with a dad and a three-year-old. And the three-year-old began to look off into the room between them. And his dad said, as his son whispered something, Out into the room, his dad said, Who's with us, bud? And the child, without changing his gaze, said, Dad, it's Jesus. He's telling me to take his hand and come with him. And they told me that his dad, with eyes full of tears, said, It's okay, son. You go with Jesus. He's going to take care of you now. 
It happens all the time. And I believe whether it is a slow transition of one we love or one who dies suddenly for whatever reason, God has someone there to take their hand and let them know that it's okay. If you ever have had or have that experience with someone, it is a very intimate and spiritual few moments, an experience you will never forget. It's a gift of grace from God to help the person transitioning from this life to be not afraid because it seems that no matter how strong our faith or how firm our beliefs of what is to come for us, when we are at that top step, getting ready to pass into some place where we have never been, there's always that little uncertainty of the unknown. And God, in God's grace, sends people to encourage us and to offer comfort on the way. And I have found over 12 years of being present with people who are ending their life in this life on this earth. It happens to everyone. It's not dependent on their faith or their beliefs or their lack of faith or even their denial. It still happens which affirms my belief that God is present and acting in all of our lives, whether we know it, whether we want it, whether we accept it, whether we believe it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because we don't choose God. God chooses us, all of us. And when our hearts are open and we embrace the faith that is present, before us in Jesus Christ, we have the added comfort throughout our lives of knowing God's grace and living in the peace of God's love and promise of what is yet to come. I love the sentence of scripture that is on the, on the wall out there as you come from the entry into the sanctuary. You know it, it's just to the right of the coffee bar and it says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Our faith is what allows us to stand in God's constant grace and forgiveness. The hymn, Amazing Grace, by an Anglican minister and slavery ab abolitionist John Newton, he wrote Amazing Grace. Now, he wasn't always a Christian minister or a slavery abolitionist. He had been a captain of slave ships and an investor in slave trade and was himself enslaved for a time in West Africa when he had been in the Royal Navy. And God working in his life, when he committed his life to God in the first church he came to after he was freed, And God's showing grace and forgiveness in his life, he wrote Amazing Grace, that reads as a legacy to his life. He didn't think he would ever be worthy of God's grace. And he wrote Amazing Grace, how sweet that sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And he wrote, the reason for God's grace and mercy is unknown to me. What I do know is I was blind and now I see. In our text, Paul is making it clear that we stand in this grace as a gift from God. It is unearned, certainly undeserved. And that's what makes grace so amazing. And it is that grace that gives us hope today and tomorrow and whatever is to come. In just a bit, we will have the privilege to baptize Ainsley Grace Harp, a sign and symbol of what has been true of her since her birth. She is a child of God, living in God's grace and God's unending love, chosen by God as God's child. No password required free access provided through Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. <laughs>